to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. It's Power Talk Friday. Here on the podcast, we've had dozens of interviews and conversations that talk about the importance of us showing up as the leader, right? Of the CEO mindset, as Desi Creswell calls it, right? The value of systems and processes in our business, second, right? And also the need to make sure that we are not down doing things that other people around us could be doing, whether they are full-time employees or subcontract employees or consultants, whatever it is. We need to always be questioning ourselves on what am I spending my time on, right? Now, if you're a longtime listener of the podcast, or maybe you're somebody that has taken professional development uh, courses, or you've worked with a coach, then you probably at least are on board with these concepts, right? And you probably get it, and maybe you've been successful at this transition. But if you're anything like me, sometimes knowing and doing can look very different, right? As creatives, as entrepreneurs, it's often difficult for us to actually find out how to get that great idea from point A to point B, or how to free ourselves from the daily tasks in the daily grind. And why? Well, because sometimes it's hard to let go, right? Sometimes it's hard to trust that somebody will do it or do it as well as we do it. And sometimes we just get in our own way. We get so stuck in the weeds that we fool ourselves that it feels productive to be doing those grind daily tasks that we really would be better served if we gave them to someone else. But my guest today, Hunter Louder, she knows the difference, and she offers us offers a service that helps get us from point A to point B efficiently because you know what she is? She's a fractional COO. <laughs> How cool is that, right? She is also the co-owner of Tortoise and the Bear, which is a business strategy, operations, and mindset coaching company that supports visionaries like you and me in bringing their wild and crazy dreams to life. She couples her ba- her past experience as a CEO of a multi-million dollar company with mindful coaching techniques and approaches. And when she does this, Hunter helps service-based business owners create and prioritize a strategic plan to grow their impact and to move their business forward in a way that's sustainable. And what I mean by that is in a way you survive it. <laughs> okay, it's to stay sustainable for you as the CEO, right? So today, Hunter is sharing with us tips for how to make the changes in our business that help us capture that CEO mindset and break us out of those day-to-day tasks. So I'm really excited to share this interview with you. Hi, Hunter. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. Thank you for having me. Hunter, 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 you are like the unicorn out there. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> literally, when I was reading about what you do in your company that you do for our companies, I was like, yes, ma'am, I'll take one Hunter, please take him there. <laughs> So here's the thing. I mean, you know, I I would say that my experience is that almost all entrepreneurs tend to be the visionary. And the more I do business coaching with interior designers and, of course, through Exciting Windows, the more I'm learning that that really, you know, it's often the visionary who does get into business, right? And if we don't have that key 
chief operating officer by our side that really just keeps towing the line, it can be weeks, months, or years of frustration for a small business owner because on the daily, you are intellectually understanding certain things need to be done, but truly in your core, it's not a really easy skill set for you to do. And your company comes in and performs that as a fractional COO. And that's super interesting to me. So Hunter, talk to me a little bit about what your experience is with meeting uh, you know, entrepreneurs and visionaries and how you are filling this, like this one lane in people's businesses. Absolutely. So it's so funny because I think everybody talks so much about creativity and visionaries and businesses and passion. And then there's the side of the uh, group that's me, that's like operations, processes, systems, you know, kind of the, <laughs> I always say we're like the fun police to a certain extent, because it's like, I know you love this business and you're so creative and you're so talented, but here's what we need to do to actually make it sustainable, help it grow, help it scale. Um, so my background is actually in the luxury hospitality industry, where I was surrounded by creatives. I mean, just every, you know, photographers, videographers, DJs, musicians, wedding planners, florists, they're just so creative. They're so visual. They're so talented. And I would just watch them struggle with their businesses over and over again when it came to like the systems and the processes and avoiding burnout with that kind of sustainable element. And so when I left that career a few years ago and decided to start my own business, I really saw like a space for myself in working with creatives and visionaries to give them that strong foundation and also to take the stuff off their plate that they really hate doing. So the thing is, that's so interesting to me because to think that someone could come from outside of our business and help us, you know, in that very almost seems intimate way was something that I would not have thought possible. But I'm going to share with you, Hunter, that my work with uh, Eileen Hahn and Jessica Harling and Amber De La Garza, these are three women that basically coach me on and off. Mm -hmm. And each one has said to me, you need a COO, or we use the language of Gina Wickman and Traction, tra Traction and say, you need an integrator. And it's and so my my point is is that until all three of them said it, it's like okay, one person says it, another person says it, another right. You know, it seems hard to understand, but each has insisted that that is something that an outside person can come in and do for you. And then I also have the experience of Sarah Brennan, who is an interior designer in our community, and she had this. Um, integrator person role come into her business for a two year period and it totally changed her business. I've had other designers on the show speak to the same thing. So I guess what I'm saying to you, Hunter, is me and my audience, we're up to speed on the concept. We get it, we want it, like give me some. But can you get us in? like maybe how we can expect to work with someone like yourself, how you come in and assess and, you know, what are the, you know, markers for doing it successfully and what should we look out for when we think about maybe hiring yourself or somebody else to do it? Of course. I feel like the first place people get to is when they start their businesses, they start with just passion, drive, expertise, energy, and typically they're very successful on the front end and mm -hmm. they almost don't know how, and they're just throwing spaghetti at the wall or trying all sorts of different marketing um, initiatives. They're going out there, they're networking, they're just doing everything they possibly can. And it's almost like idealistic, almost serendipitous, because it's just like, wow, this thing that I love, this thing that I'm talented at, I'm actually succeeding in having a business like that. And then they'll typically hit a plateau. So all of a sudden leads dry up, marketing's not working, people aren't buying their products. And it's almost like they don't know why. They don't know what really happened. And that's typically where I'll come in because they want to bring in an outside business consultant to essentially see what they can't see because they're in it so much, they really are missing out like the forest for the trees type of concept. Is it always that the plateau is that the leads dry up? Because I would almost see that it's also possible that the plateau is 
it's going so well, but now the train is racing down the track and I feel like I'm not in charge of it anymore. So that I see that side of it, both I've experienced it, but also in the designers that I've met and spoke with. So is it, is that a legitimate other indicator that it's time for a COO? That's very true. So when you get to the point where you can't handle the business that's coming in, and what I see a lot of people do is they will, you know, stop following up with leads, like they'll stop uh, getting back to them, they'll stop taking the leads that are coming in. And so then it can kind of catch up to them where they are like, what happened to my business? What happened to my revenue? So usually it's either that your leads are coming in too much too quickly, and you just can't handle it. And that's when you need to bring in a COO or an integrator type person to really put those systems in place so that you can continue to grow your business without necessarily having to grow uh, like a team or an agency if that's not part of your path. Mm -hmm. And then the other place that I see happen and I, and you tell me I'm sharing experience between personal and, and men and women that I've coached is that the, the, the original entrepreneur gets it going, gets all the things mm-hmm. happening, gets it to three to five employees maybe, right? But now the business is growing and decisions need to be made on the daily. And the whole organization is accustomed to that CEO, CEO to being the decision maker. But my experience is that there's that moment where the visionary is seeing the next level for the business, but is consistently caught in the weeds on the day-to-day decisions. But because the business has gotten to say three quarters of a million or a million Mm -hmm. five, you know, somebody has got to make those decisions, but the three to five faces that are there, you know, they're amazing, wonderful people. They're doing their role, but their role isn't to now make decisions. And I think a lot of us just expect people that we hire for specific roles to move to the next level, but it might not ever be their superpower to do that. And that's Mm -hmm. where this outside person comes in and becomes the one that oversees the day-to-day decisions. Is that also a legitimate or you're like, no, 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 no. You're wishing for a unicorn. That's not it. No, not at all. You're absolutely right on. I think when you get to that point, again, the CEO uh, and what I always talk about is they go from like being that entrepreneur, wearing all the hats, the person that's, you know, taking the phone calls, sending out the proposals, paying all the bills, and they need to step into that CEO role where they really are the leadership, they're the director, they're the idea person. And then to have a team underneath of them, whether that's large or small, depending on their business, of people that really complement them, that really fill those voids of activities that they are either not good at doing or they they hate doing. And so when you have a CEO who's a visionary and a creative actually freed up to do the things that they love, the business is going to move forward by leaps and bounds versus the visionary trying to uh, pay the bills or answer the phones or return the emails, which are mm-hmm. what we like to call sometimes those $5 tasks, mm-hmm. which are very easily hired out for. And again, freeing up their time and their mental space to do what they actually are brilliant at doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the thing is, the challenge in there is the challenge is more than finding the right person, mm-hmm. because that's challenging enough. And hopefully you're going to share some tips on how to do that. But the challenge is also for that entrepreneur to let go, right? And to trust that other person that to make those decisions. That's, that's not an easy thing to do, especially whether, you know, whether you're in business two years or 10, whatever point you scale to that level that this is required, I, I don't really care if it's two years or 10, because if it's two years, it's two years of every day of making every decision. <laughs> I mean, that's Absolutely. hard to, you know, I guess somebody's making the decisions over here while I'm over there doing this, right? Absolutely. And I think that letting go is, I mean, it's like a baby, you know, you created this, it was your blood, sweat and tears. You have great visions for it, great ideas for it. And so I tell my clients all the time that growing is tough. There is a lot of trust in that. And you really want to find people who are aligned with your values. So a lot of times people want to hire for skill set, like, oh, you need to have all these uh, tech tools, or you need to understand how this software works, or you need to have gone through this course of study. And my philosophy is that skills can always be trained, but really what you're trying to find is someone who has similar values to you, uh, who really is going to work as almost like a strategic partner in helping you grow your business. 
And that is the little nudge there. You just said, first of all, I agree with the value. So I'm glad that you brought that up because that's, I think that's in every relationship that we create, right? Whether it's a friend, a, a new girlfriend, a new boyfriend, a husband, a wife, a spouse, you know, you know, I don't know, a friend to go to yoga with. Like if you don't share the same values, it's not going to last. It's not sustainable because you start looking at the other person going, that's cracked. What are you doing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. But the other part that you said in there was interesting is that, I I get that we do want to hire for culture fit, for values, for the things that you said, but for for strategy, like that's like a little like that's a little fluffy out there that you that to uh, to imagine. And like I said, I know it to be true with the, you know, hard hard push from these three brilliant women in my life, so I trust them. But it seems crazy, and I think that's it's probably a a tough point for many entrepreneurs to think I can bring a stranger in here and they could from the gate, not grow up in my company, but from the gate, be a partner in strategy. That's, 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 that's big thing. How, how do how do you come in in somebody's business and do that? Absolutely. So two things are coming to mind for me. Um, Number one, so when I talk about values, the other two elements of that are the company's mission statement and the company's vision. So a lot of times with these companies, when they start, again, it's just built on passion, blood, sweat, and tears. And so I typically take my clients back to the beginning and say, great, you've built this beautiful business. You've just been going gung-ho left and right and been successful. Let's actually put a foundation in place. And like, what is your mission? Which is your what? Like, what is your business doing? Who are you serving? What products are you offering? And then let's look at your vision, which is your why, which is just wonderful to come back to when you're having a horrible day. <laughs> like, <laughs> I want to burn this to the ground. And it's like, no, no, here's my why. Okay, I'm going to be centered again. And then your values on top of that is kind of like the how. It's kind of like the, the spice, the flavor that you put on everything. So when they have their mission, their vision, and their values, then it's not very like, uh, you know, kind of fluffy and spiritual. It's very much like a corporate uh, manifesto almost where it's like, here's my business. Here's why I'm here. Here's what I do. And here's how I do it. And then people even get such great clarity, not only for their team and who they might bring on board, but even more clarity for their clientele. Okay. So it's funny because all of my colleagues listening know that I'm like a broken record with mission, vision, values. And (laughs) I always tell the funny story that and, you know, in my first book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, I mean, I'm sorry, the first chapter is Establish Your Mission, Vision, Values. And there was this one young designer, Laurel, that came on and she had been at my live event and she had read the book and she was on the podcast about two years or so after she opened her business. And she was explaining the story to us, Hunter, how she kind of went in all different directions in the first year and a half or so of her business, like down mm-hmm. one lane and down another lane and blah, blah, blah. And... um. And so I said to her at one point, I was like, you know, she goes, and now when I finally know what my mission is and my vision is and where, what, how I want to do just what you just said, she goes, I feel so much better. And I'm, I get up every day with direction. And I just Mm -hmm. said to her, I said, I have to ask you, you are at Luann, like you read my first book, right? She goes, oh yeah. And I'm like, well, how did you read it two years ago? And she goes, Luann, honestly, I just skipped the first chapter. I thought I wanted to get to the good business stuff. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. <laughs> right? You know, she's like, I started to read it. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll come back to that. How do I get to the good stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Go straight to the end. The that's end. it. Conclusion. That's it. But we all learn, right? We all learn the hard way that, you know, we don't all learn the hard way. Some of us listen. I, d- I also had to learn the hard way. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you learn that, you know, there is a foundation. There is a one, two, three. There is a the path for a reason because it works, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> so what are some of those? foundational. So the, we have the foundational pieces of the mission, vision, value. And is, is that really the, that's the core and we move on to next things or once that's defined and you're working with your new um, COO, what's next? Are there other strategies or foundational pieces that have to be figured out for that, that outside COO to be effective in our business? Absolutely. So that is definitely the first step to even just communicate your mission, vision, values to your COO, to your clientele and to your other team members. That's just such a great revelation right there. And a lot of times it really can eliminate a lot of um, overwhelm or burnout or uh, analysis paralysis, because every decision you make now, you can just look back to your mission, vision and values and say, does this fit? It doesn't fit. Okay, then I'm not going to do it. Uh, Oh, it does fit. Great. This is probably something I should move forward on. So it just really gets rid of that like 
endless decision fatigue that we can have as business owners. So then the second step I take them on is we look at the strategic objectives of basically any business. So this could be brick and mortar, online business. It could be at five figures. It could be a multi eight. And essentially each business has um, seven strategic objectives, everything from finances to team development, to product development, to technology Etc. So we really go through that. What are the goals? What are the current projects? What is like on your bucket list, your wish list that you just never have been able to get to? And then at the end of that, we actually rate those seven strategic objectives by which one is most important to the client. And then again, that gives us kind of that North Star, that compass of like, here's our mission, vision, value. So every decision has to fit into that. And then here's what we said our number one priority for this quarter is. So don't go off on a tangent and decide that you're going to go down this path. <laughs> who, um, us visionaries, go <laughs> running down the wrong road? Come on, I Hunter. I always never say, stall on how to do that, have you? <laughs> I always say I'm a chaos coordinator. That's like my uh, my number one job is just like, no, like, like I said, being the fun police, basically. It's like, we'll do that next quarter or, you know, just hold off. Let's get this goal taken care of first. Oh um, so once we do that, then they have these big goals for the quarter. So then a little bit of that uh, overwhelm starts to sneak in where it's like, well, how do I know what to do Monday through Friday in order to reach this goal three months from now? And then that's where I kind of bring in reverse engineering in order to solve that problem. So basically we look at their goals for the quarter and then we break it down into bite-sized pieces for what do they need to do every month, every week, and then every day in order to reach their goals. And then at that point, they literally have their you know, compass, they have their direction, they have their priorities, and they have what tasks they can do each day to help move them closer to their goals. Well, that just sounds like such amazing stuff right there. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. I get it. And, you know, this isn't the first conversation I've had about this. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm incorrigible is what it is. You know, mm-hmm. like I said, I work with Amber Dilla Garza and she is a productivity specialist. I've had conversations with Deborah Scarpa about the visionary integrator role. I said my co- my cousin Eileen Hahn. Um, you know, we've got multiple members in Exciting Windows running the traction system, which is pretty much mm-hmm. having a COO, right? And it's like one of these things where it's all makes, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, give me some of that. I want some of that. But I feel like translating it to like what, when, when someone, if you think about you as a COO that can be hired as a fractional, what are the criteria do you, that you think someone who's looking into your business as hiring should be considering? Like we're going out looking for this person and we are already so scattered that Mm -hmm. we're having trouble focusing. I just feel like, okay, I'm going to get 16 referrals and and then I'm going to like have 16 referrals six months from now. (laughs) You know what I mean? So talk, is there, are there clear steps that we can say to ourselves? this indicates that, well, we did what indicates the the, the two or three scenarios where it really feels like we need one, but then boiling it further down, the types of questions that we should ask, the types of things that we're looking for. And then, you know, we'll go back towards the results that we can think to get for, for having it. Of course. I think I have got something that's slightly nebulous and then something that's more concrete. So the nebulous one is a little bit about mindset. So we work with our clients a lot on this as well, where it's not just like, oh, mission, vision, values, here's these spreadsheets, smart goals, et cetera. It is a mindset issue where why are you resisting hiring this person? Like, what do you think could go right? What do you think could go wrong? Like, where do you need to be in order for this problem to be big enough for you to want to solve? And a lot of times I make the analogy about people who hire personal trainers or professional athletes that have professional coaches, you know, we have this mindset in this, um, in this world that something has to be a problem to be fixed, that something has to be a crisis to be like triaged. And I really want my clients to be more proactive in the sense of like, wow, my business is doing really well. How can I get it to the next level? I need to bring in an expert. I need to bring in an outside opinion. I need to bring in someone who can help me grow. Um, Now, unfortunately we live in that society where it's more like, oh no, (laughs) I'm going to shut my business down. What happened? I'm overwhelmed. I have too much work. This is a crisis. I'm running around scattered. And so I really try and encourage people that when they're at that point of like, wow, my business is going really well. How can I keep this momentum long-term sustainably and keep growing it versus being in that crisis mode? 
Um, but if they are in that crisis mode and they do have that problem, then what I've been telling people, the first step is to actually do a time audit. So to spend about two weeks, and there's a free app called Toggle, T-O-G-G-L, where you can create a free account and then create the categories in your business. Um, for example, like admin, marketing, product creation, client work, uh, bookkeeping, that type of thing, whatever you do in your business, and literally clock in and out of your business for, I'd say at least two weeks, but if you can only do a week, that's fine. And then at the end of that week, look at where you're spending your time. Are you spending your time on client work and deliverables and customer experience and education, the things that are so important for the visionary? Or are you spending your time uh, responding to emails or putting out fire with your web server or uh, paying your bills every week? And really, what do you want to be doing in your business? Where are you most valuable in your business? And where can you actually make more money if you pass along those tasks to someone who's more of an admin or integrator? Wow. Wow. I love that. You know what? I, you know what, you know, what really hit me between the eyes. What you said is, is what would it take to get you to make mm -hmm. this decision to do this? Like, do you require there to be a five alarm fire in your business? <laughs> right? Like it's so true. And I, and, and maybe you can shed some light on it, but I think it's kind of like, we're so accustomed to feeling very self-reliant. You know what I'm hearing? And Amber, if she ever listens to this podcast, she'll be like, oh, my God, Luann, there you go again. <laughs> because I oh, I have the mindset situation that if if I'm not getting it done, it's my default mindset is I just didn't discipline myself enough to do it. Mm -hmm. And she's just consistently saying to me, that is not true. <laughs> like, I don't see anybody who works as hard and as dedicated and as focused as you do. Like, Absolutely. you know what I mean? And it's like, no, but I mean, if I didn't get that done, I mean, I just didn't make time to do it or I wasn't effective that day or I, this and that and the other thing. And so I think what happens is you tend to feel like just, just show up better tomorrow and I won't need another person. I can mm -hmm. get it done. Right. Do you do you find that a lot with visionaries that they think that way and talk that way to themselves? Oh, yeah. If I could just push through it, if I could think my way through this, if I could just <laughs> take one more course, download one more freebie, you know, <laughs> um, go to one more networking event, then everything will be fixed. And right. I think it, it takes a little bit of having to look outside yourself for that, whether that's a friend, a coach, a mentor to kind of say, hey you're mm -hmm. running yourself ragged and it's not your fault. It's not on you. And I think especially nowadays with so much attention, uh, a lot of my clients are neurodiverse in addition to being creatives and visionaries and they don't learn the way everybody else does. And they don't think the way everybody else does. And that's beautiful. And that's why they're so talented and successful. And so one of my big things is that when everybody says you have to think a certain way, you have to act a certain way, you have to do a certain way. None of that's true. Because we've seen time and time again, the true visionaries, inventors, creatives, like masters of their time have been the ones mm -hmm. that think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Right. It's so true. Right. It is so true. It's, you know, when you see it on the darn movies, you're just like, wow, <laughs> you know, that person was really off the wall, but look what they created. Mm -hmm. Right. It's Absolutely. like totally thinking a different way. So I love that the mindset part of it is you know, the mindset is part of what you address, because I do think the whether it's the stories that we tell ourselves, we talk a lot on the show about the stories that we tell ourselves about fees and charging. Mm. And I've said completely transparently to my audience for years, yeah, I don't have a problem. I don't have a story in my head about charging my worth, but I do have crazy, crazy stories in my head about what my expectations of myself are. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And they're just as um, debilitating is not the word because they're not debilitating, but they're just as damaging, I guess, is kind mm -hmm. of a word. Right. They're just they're just as inhibitive it is. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, OK. And so you said that was the nebulous part. And then what was the other part? So then the concrete part was kind of doing that toggle uh, time audit. Oh, okay. So really like very much numbers, facts. It's black or white. It's in your face. You can see exactly what you've actually been focusing your business on. And uh, one more thing, I will actually go back to the nebulous side of thing you mentioned, like language is so important. How we talk to ourselves, how we talk to our clients, our copywriting, our marketing. And a big thing I'd say to my clients at first is we really try and eliminate the words should, have to, must, and even mm -hmm. need to, because when that stuff starts coming up, it's usually like, 
where's that coming from? Is that something your parents said? Is that something your college professor said? Is that something that your friends and colleagues expect of you? Whereas even if we just change it slightly to, instead of I have to do this, I want to do this, mm. it's automatically just lifts a huge weight off of people's shoulders. And again, they can go back to their mission, vision, values and say, is this in line? I want to do it. It's in line. Great. It's like green light. And it just takes so much of that pressure of decision making off of them. Yes. Love it. I love it. Now, what is the, you talked about a moment, uh, a couple of moments ago about reverse engineering your business. And mm -hmm. is that where you're talking about, you figure out the quarterly and then you go backwards and figure out what you're going to do daily, weekly, monthly. Is that what you meant there? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I guess too, is part of the role of a COO you know, we come up with this together, but you don't leave that CEO on its own to go and do it then. It's, it's right. the, the, there's accountability because that's the thing. It's the accountability. Mm. Like if I'm the one in charge, then, you know, if I didn't do it, who's going to say anything, right? So it, it, is there, and of course, if somebody is going to invest their money in hiring a COO, then of, yes, but that is the other part of it is that you as the outside person or the strategic partner in this are setting up the accountability as past, Hey, you said you were going to do this every day or every month. Right. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you do that? So I was going to say it varies depending on the size of the company as well. So if I'm coming in to someone who has a team, maybe they have a uh, operations manager or they have an executive assistant or somebody that can help them with the productivity and the accountability side, then I will kind of leave them with a project that is outlining, you know, milestones, due dates, the exact tasks that need to be done and who's doing them. Uh, and then they can go off and do that on their own. Now, if I'm working with somebody who might be more of a, a solopreneur where they're the only ones in their business, or maybe they're a partnership and they don't quite have the team together yet, then I will really work with them on making sure that project is set up in a way that the task can actually get done every day. So whether that's, whether that's they keep me on for accountability, or sometimes I will move into the next step after we have a plan of actually helping them find uh, their own unicorn, <laughs> their own perfect person uh, to bring into their company so that they can continue moving forward. Okay. And it's funny because one of, uh, I had a conversation with a designer just today who is in act is actively searching for this, this role for her design firm. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. So there's a situation where you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly large firm, mid-sized firm, seven, eight people total between in-house employees and contract employees and runs a good size, multiple millions mm -hmm. and has had a situation this week where one of the design mat project managers missed checking, double checking something and resulted in a, you know, almost, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollar mistake. Mm. Okay. Plain English. And what she said to me was, I cannot get this operations person soon enough because mm. if I have to check everything, then I'm doing it. <laughs> like yeah. like what is the difference between, you know, me checking everything and actually doing it? And so is that a reasonable expectation that and 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 is and is that role actually different than a COO? Is it a di like so? It's an operations manager versus a COO, or and how about in relation to the way your company actually works? Would because she, she's looking for someone that cares as much as that she cares, but has a high level of seeing all the parts the way she sees all the parts, but then has their actual focus is in the weeds, making sure the people mm -hmm. assigned with the weeds work is completing it properly. Is that a reasonable expectation? And what role is that? It is absolutely. And what's coming to mind for me is that every position in a company, there are four different levels that can be possible in that position. So it's like a triangle. So at the top of the triangle is the vision or the visionary, which is typically going to be the owner of the company. And then below that you have the strategy. And then below that, you have management. And then at the very bottom, the biggest part of the triangle is implementation. So a lot of times what you'll see is that one person will own multiple categories, depending on how big the company is. And that's where things can get a little bit troublesome. 
Mm. So her as the owner of the company is the visionary and it's a seven to eight person company, like you mentioned. So she probably really shouldn't be too much into the strategy minus like, here's what we're doing for the year. Here's our goal. But that person's job is really to uh, come up with new products, to market, to network, to get the name out there, to be the representative of the brand. And so what they want to bring in is uh, like a fractional COO who's really going to handle the strategy and the management of the strategy. And then at the bottom, you have the implementation of the actual doing of the strategy. But when you have the owner, because it sounds like she's doing vision, strategy, management, Mm -hmm. and then she's also cleaning up messes and implementation, it's no wonder she's overwhelmed (laughs) in a subtle sense. Yes. Yeah. And, and and disillusioned, right? Like, mm-hmm. just like, what the hell? Like, how, do, how does this happen? You know? Um, and I guess the thing is, if you were to, and I love the way you just like literally saw it so clearly. So it's not that we should expect the people that are in the impl- implementation uh, lane to never make a mistake. That's mm-hmm. not like, see, that's what my, my way of thinking is. I, I know we're all going to make mistakes, all of us. So it's not that, okay, I need better people that are, in, that are doing the implementation that are not going to make mistakes. It's the answer is she needs that management level in between overseeing it with eyes every day, as opposed to her eyes, which is check-in eyes once a week or once every three days or whatever it is. Right. Absolutely. And I think when you have a business set up where someone can make a forty to fifty thousand dollar mistake, you know, really examining what happened there. You know, what was that a system issue? Was that a management issue? Uh, does she need better people, different people? You know, that's really an important thing to really examine. Um, hopefully again, hopefully before it happens, <laughs> not in a yeah. reactive way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no. I mean, and these are the tough lessons that you learn in business, right? So, okay. All right. And so it's, it's, it's a logical thing. I love that it's a logical thing and specifically your company now, you know, you can't be this management level for 20, 30, 40 companies. So what would happen in this case, you would maybe come in and do some um, consulting with her and just help her define roles and what she's going to go look for? Or are you able to actually function as that strategy management piece for multiple companies? I'm able to function for, I would say, again, depending on the size of the company, for about three to four companies as a fractional COO, mm-hmm. um, depending on what they need, of course. But that's, that's usually about my limit. And I actually really enjoy working very deeply with people and helping them on their long-term goals. But if I'm full or maybe they don't have the budget or the need for that, people also bring me in on a project basis, whether that's to bring on their team bring on their technology, put their systems in place, like with, you know, standard operating procedures, SOPs, and that kind of thing. So that's where I have more of a short-term uh, offer that I offer to people that's about a six-week program, mm. where we come up with their uh, strategy, their to-dos, and their projects for a quarter. And so they can either do that for one quarter and then go about their merry way, or they can come back to me every single quarter. Uh, it just really depends on... And what I love about my business is it's so not cookie cutter. So it's like, mm-hmm. I wish I could say every single business is the same. Here's exactly what I do. But <laughs> I go into businesses that are so, so different. And so it just depends on where they are. And my big talent is I'm a super solution oriented person. So mm-hmm. I don't care what problem you're having. I can absolutely find a solution for you. It might be outside the box, might be counterintuitive. Um, but that's really what I offer to my clients is uh, decades of business experience in multiple types of business where I can look at your problem from the outside objectively and I can help you solve it. Cause it's, you're looking at it subjectively as your baby <laughs> and you're like, no, why is this happening? It's like, okay, let me come in and be that neutral person who can really get you back on track and headed towards your goals. Okay. Okay. And so when I envision the process of working with you where it's that six week and we're, you know, setting up the goals for the quarter, then you are, outlining for us what the deliverables are well, working with us to outline the deliverables and working with us to establish what the accountability is, but then you're back out again. And we're now either finding someone else in our team to be the accountability role, or we're functioning as that accountability, you know, being the one to be accountable 
um, until we, we get to the point where we're ready to hire for a full, actually full on COO. Is that, that right? Is, that's usually true. I do offer like an accountability kind of ongoing consulting as well. If people are like, you know what, I just want to talk to you every week and make sure that I'm headed towards my goals. Um, I don't want you like looming over my shoulder or necessarily in my business just yet, but I do want somebody there as kind of that outside resource to help me move forward. So the three ways I work with people is that retainer, that six week program. And then I can also do ongoing accountability if that's really where they need help. Very interesting. Okay. So now one of the things is that having come from the luxury industry that you did come from, I don't want to not have a few minutes on this conversation because of course that's a direct correlation to interior design is, Mm -hmm. you know, and you talk about the difference between an average customer experience and a luxurious customer experience. So give us your, you know, feelings and thoughts on that, Hunter. Absolutely. So one of the things I look at with all my clients is we do like a customer journey audit. And again, it's just a very, from start to finish, how do your customers find you? What process do they go through until they hire you? How do you onboard them, offboard them? How do you follow up with them if they don't hire you right away? And it's just so amazing how many very, very small things can be implemented to make that process so much more easy for the client to implement, but also more luxurious for their clients to experience. And is that a one-off service? Because that, I mean, I, 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 is that a one-off service? Well, it's so funny. I wasn't going to say this just yet, but you actually reminded me. We actually have a free customer journey audit that I offer for podcast listeners. Oh, wow. um, so after they listen to this podcast, they can visit our website and sign up for a free customer journey audit. And within three to five business days, I essentially send them back. It's usually about a 20 to 30 minute audit where I have at least three actionable suggestions of things they can do really easily in order to kind of plug the holes or make the customer journey a more luxurious experience. Okay. I love that. And the thing about that is, is, you know, it, it seems it's, it's obvious. We know the reason why, but we have to say it out loud. The reason why that we want to up level our customer service experience is because then we up level our fees, we up level our mm-hmm. profitability, we up level every aspect of our business. It's that whole strategy of rather do 10 customers with this gross profit than 30 customers mm-hmm. at this gross profit, right? Absolutely. Okay. And do you find that when you review people's audits or you actually work with someone to improve their customer journey uh, experience, are there certain places that are typical that, you know, busy, but well, well well-intentioned, but busy, you know, interior designers are going to drop the ball on something like that on that customer journey experience? I would say overarchingly where I'm always amazed is how people really drop the ball on follow-up. Mm -hmm. Um, we are so focused on bringing new clients in, you know, that kind of top of the funnel, like getting new faces, getting new people on our email list, getting new podcast listeners. And then of course the clients that just hire us and sign the contracts, like no question, but then there's a, I would say a pretty large majority for successful businesses of clients that just kind of go by the wayside. And sometimes they're just not quite ready yet. Um, they needed to make a decision. They needed to move some money around, you know, maybe they were deciding on a certain design or decor and, they don't never get followed up with. And I cannot remember the name of the journal. I will need to look it up, but there was a survey that came out a few years ago that said that I think it was 85% of all people that inquire in a business end up purchasing within 18 months. Oh yeah. Uh, You know what? We, we, we had Mark Richardson, uh, give a presentation, right? Is that the same guy that you are? I think it, I think it is the same guy that said that. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. I was like, what is his name? <laughs> yes, I, I think it is because we had him speak at our mm. CEO conference for Exciting Windows in oh, the beautiful. fall of 2021, I want to okay. say. I don't remember what it was. Uh, maybe it was spring of 2022. I don't know. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> but he spoke and he said, he told us that statistic. And of course mm-hmm. my husband, Vinny is like a rabid animal when it comes to follow-up <laughs> awesome. and, and he is just like, he's every single week in the sales meetings. He's like, if you give somebody a quote three days later, you have to ask them if mm-hmm. they got it. If you give if they said they got it three days later, you have to call them and say, do you have any questions? If they said that, you're not, la, 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 la. and <laughs> when, when Mark told us that, st- that statistic, 
then you know you you just literally put fire on Nagara. Like you just <laughs> literally put fire. He's like, see, eighty five percent of the people are going to buy in the next year, and if you're not the one following up, they're just gonna call somebody else. You Absolutely. Know? And we yes. have those like three week or three months, six month, nine month, maybe follow up plans, and then after that, it usually drops off. And so I think the point of that is you know, 18 months is actually the time period. And so if you want to increase your closing ratio and increase your sales, then having a follow-up plan and again, an automated one, it doesn't have to necessarily involve your time and attention, depending on how big your company is, where you're reaching out to these people, or at least giving yourself a reminder Mm -hmm. to reach out to these people. And the great thing about that is it actually could make the sale a lot easier because if it's a year down the road and they still haven't done anything, then you're kind of like a sore reminder of this thing that they (laughs) wanted to do and still have not moved forward on. So a lot of times that even increases your chances of Mm -hmm. them becoming a client. And the fact that you even remembered them, people feel so anonymous, I think, with uh, as consumers sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that you're like, hey, we talked a year ago, how's your project going? And they're like, I never started my project. So good to hear from you. I would love to get it started now. It's just such a great conversation. Yes. And see, I love that. You know, I'm, I'm, I love that spin. And um, anyone listening that is coached with me, they know that this is the way I'm always spinning things. It's like, mm. take it out of your head. You feel funny a year later, 18 months later to reach out, but flip it around. Like that person is going to, just what you just said, Hunter, that person is going to think, wow, mm-hmm. this, this person remembers me. Like, yes. they're not like you're bothering me, even if they <laughs> don't want to do it, even if they did get it done somewhere else. I don't think the knee jerk reaction is, I can't believe you're calling me 18 months later. I think the knee jerk reaction is what you said. Huh. That's interesting that that company like continues to do follow up. That that's either, either they're literally personalizing and saying, I can't believe they remembered me. Right. Or they're just observing the organization of the company and the, the, the stick to itness of it, right. Stick to it. If this, I don't think. <laughs> so. Well, it reminds me of sending like holiday cards comes to mind. So for example, if you send holiday cards to anybody that ever inquired in your company, that's fine. That's wishing them well. That's a lovely gesture. That's reminding them that you exist, but somehow following up on a sales call all of a sudden people have all these thoughts and feelings about it where it's like, all you're doing is checking in on them. Right. You're not showing up with a contract and saying, Hey, you called me a year ago. <laughs> it's time to sign this bad boy. Let's go. You're just checking up on them. Hey, how's it going? How's your project? How did it turn right. out? Right. And if they say, Oh, it went great. I, I went with a competition. Oh, great. Who'd you go with? And now you have valuable information about who they went with instead of you. And that's important for business owners to know. Right. And if they didn't move forward with it, maybe they're ready now. It's like, great. You're there right at the perfect moment to Mm -hmm. start working with them. And I think once you've experienced that at even one time where the reaction is positive, Mm -hmm. it makes it easier to do it other times. Because I know with window works, I've had exactly that reaction. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad you called. I've been meaning to (laughs) call you for six months. And I just, you know, the thing happened and then the water heater broke and the la 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 la. But my husband keeps saying to me, (laughs) when are you going to call those people to get the drapes done? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So a hundred percent. sometimes that no can be a great relief as well. So someone who says, oh, thank you so much for your call, but I'm not interested anymore. Great. That's one less person you have to follow up with now. Right. You now just you take them out of the list. focus your energy somewhere else. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So talk to us a little bit before I let you go about, y- give me some actual observations, boots on the ground. I shared a lot of the things that I know that I personally experience as, um, you know, the questions surrounding this and what I've learned from the men and women that I've coached, but just give us some, you know, you're ready for this. If you, this, this is the kind of results that you can expect, whether it's your company hunter or someone else's company, I recognize you're here to talk about your company, but you know, you can't like, I, we got 10,000 listeners. Like, like, like no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I got news for you. We all can't hire you. <laughs> so, so, but you know, we probably, like I said, this conversation keeps coming up every couple of months and I guarantee you, whether it's one or 20 or 30, People listening right now are probably thinking, okay, this is it. I I am not going to wait till a crisis. I am going to be proactive and I know this is what my business needs. So, you know, things to look for, things to ask, you know, what, give us some tips on it. Of course. So I think a lot of it has to do with, um, it does start with feelings. And I think we all want to like live in our heads and not acknowledge feelings. Mm -hmm. But typically these businesses are such passion businesses and people are just so enamored with their business. So a lot of times I start to see them almost like 
falling out of love with their business and they really feel like they're doing more things that they hate than they love. Mm. So that's usually like a, a good red flag of like, wow, I used to just wake up every day. Maybe I worked 10 hours a day. Maybe I worked four hours a day and I loved it. And now it's just like pulling teeth to get me to even show up and do the things that I used to enjoy. So I always have people really identify that they've kind of fallen out of love with their business. And we really want to get them back in love with their business right. and uh, growing. The second thing I normally see is I've mentioned a lot like overwhelm uh, or burnout. Like you're exhausted. You're dropping the ball. You're forgetting things. You're not showing up for appointments. Uh, you're making mistakes that are either costing you clients or money. And it almost seems like it's happening all at once. Like maybe a month ago, you're like, this never happened. And now you're like, why is this <laughs> happening every single day? You know, staff is quitting. Sometimes contracts are falling out. Things just aren't working. It's just hard. And so sometimes it's really difficult to recognize that. But if you kind of just you know, be with your business a little bit and really take some time to think about it versus just doing all the time. It's like, what's your level of satisfaction? Like a really easy question is like, what's your level of satisfaction with your business right now on a scale of one to 10? If it's below like a seven, then you probably want to examine like, why is it your clients? Is it your pricing? Is it your team? Is it your marketing? Like, what are you dissatisfied with? And that's going to give you a really good indication as to either who you need to bring on or what skills you need to work on yourself. Uh, it's kind of like that wheel of life exercise. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Mm -mm. Um, so there's like nine different areas of life. You know, you have finances, relationships, health, career, et cetera. And essentially it's a circle, uh, like a pie chart. And you rate each area of your life on a scale of one to 10, as far as uh, highest satisfaction to lowest. And then the idea is that you work on the areas of lowest satisfaction, because that's where everything else is fine. Everything else is in stasis. It's doing well. But the areas where you're not satisfied is really where you need to focus. Um, so part of what I offer to my clients is we actually do like a wheel of business where we look at the different areas of their business, those different seven strategic objectives and rate their level of satisfaction. And then that typically gives me an idea as to what they need to work on first. And that's how we progress from there. Okay, great. I love that. And then when we think to go out and look for this person, do you have a couple of questions that the, that, a, that a potential COO should be able to just give you straightforward answers to like, like I'll give you an example. So I interviewed someone who is an SEO strategist and I was explaining how one of my chairman of the board clients had a really, really awful experience with an SEO company that after six months, I, I mean, I, 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 plain English highway robbery, just like mm -hmm. literally ripped her off, did not do any of the deliverables. And what happened was in pulling it apart, I think we both realized that, the deliverables were not clearly enunciated and they mm -hmm. were talked about in terms that, you know, felt like, you know, mumbo jumbo. Mm -hmm. And so then instead now I said, okay, if I'm looking for an SEO person, what am I putting to the line? What am I putting on the table and saying, how do I evaluate them? So what are some of the questions that you would expect if you were going to go hire a COO that you're going to say, I want to know this, this, and this. Absolutely. So my, I'm a big connector type person. Like I'm huge on uh, knowing people in your industry, having friends, people in your industry, networking with those people as well. And that would literally be the first place that I would go is to look at somebody who maybe they're a little bit more successful than I am, or their business is where I want my business to be and find out who works with them. Uh, the great thing about fractional people like us is that they can work with multiple clients. So it's not like, oh, they're just with that person and I can't you know, go anywhere else with that. Right. Um, so that's usually the first place I look is getting a personal recommendation, I think is half the battle. If you don't have that ability and you just want to either put a job ad out there or start to interview people, then I believe the question you brought up, actually the SEO company and then the other woman you mentioned that had the $40,000 mistake makes me think about. The question to ask is, tell me about a project that did not go well or that, you know, had, had difficulties and how you fixed it and how you approached it. Because people's ability to problem solve, like I mentioned earlier, I think is the number one thing that integrators and COOs do. It's things happen, mistakes happen. We're all human. How do I fix it? How do I move forward? Um, so I think that's a number one fantastic question. And again, outside of that, you have skills, you have certifications, you have all these things. But to me, how someone handles a crisis situation and solves it is the number one indicator of if they're going to be the right fit for your team. Okay. And then what, what can we expect them? 
how can we expect them to express to us or I'm going to say prove to us, prove mm-hmm. to us that they have the ability to come in, take this, you know, do these questions, ask, you know, the circle of life and ask all their goals and then put it into an action plan. Of course, you're looking for someone who's going to come in and take charge. They are not coming into the conversation and saying, well, what do you want? What do you think? What have you tried? What if blah, blah, blah. They might find that information out to get a background, but they really are coming to you and saying, here's what I've seen from your website, your social media, all the research I've done on you, what you said your goals are, and here's what I would suggest. So you really want someone who's coming in again as that strategic partner, not someone who's waiting around for you to give them tasks to do because they're not your administrative assistant. That's a totally different role. You really want somebody who's like, I see you, I see where you're strong, I see where you're weak, and I see exactly how I can help you fill those gaps. Okay, so we can expect that when we ultimately connect with somebody that we're going to interview, that they should at least have something to come to the table with just based on researching our businesses to the level they can. And Absolutely. through the, okay, see, see, I can sink my teeth into that. And I feel like <laughs> that first interview to me is like a first date. Right. So if you are not wowed on that first interview, that first conversation, then mark that person off your list because it only goes downhill from there. Typically we're on our best behavior on interviews. We're on our best behavior for proposals. So you really want someone coming in who has ideas, who has experience, who has uh, eyes on your business and cares about your business and is really leading you into what the solutions are versus someone who's coming in and saying, great, give me your to-do list. It's like, well, no, we're not at that point. <laughs> I need, right. I want to grow my business. I don't want just my to-dos done. You know, that's part of it, but not the biggest part. Right. That's the thing. And that's interesting. That's, that's good information. And I don't know who else thinks it's good information, but I definitely do because <laughs> I don't know that I would have thought that it was reasonable to think that someone, you know, based on maybe some research and a conversation would sit down and say, this is what I see that you need. Like I would think I, they would have to get up to speed two or three. I would have to take the chance on them. They would have to work for me for X amount of weeks or months. And then they say, this is what I think you need. You know what I mean? So, but you're saying there should be some level of that kind of, um, you know, seeing that in their personality from day one. Absolutely. They should just have that natural insight, I think, into business. And that's why I say too, my my clients all vary and their businesses all vary, but business at the end of the day is more or less the same concept. You know, it's about, Mm -hmm. um, you know, optimizing your hours, getting your products out there, having clients purchase them and providing amazing uh, delivery or fulfillment of your offers. So it really doesn't matter if you're brick and mortar online, five figures, nine figures, whatever you are, the concepts are still the same. And so someone who comes in that understands business, period, and can give you that feedback is really going to be a game changer. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'll take two. <laughs> <laughs> take two and call me in the morning. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hunter, thank you so much. Oh, I mean, you. it's so helpful. And um, I know so many of us need you know, the services of a COO, an integrator, whatever words we want to use, the person who makes all the things happen, all the Mm -hmm. magic in our head. You know, like I remember Amber saying to me, she's like, you know, there are people, Luann, that you sit down with and like all your ideas spill out. And the next day they put it in, it comes to you in a spreadsheet. I'm like, there are? (laughs) So that's exciting. So Hunter, just let everybody know how they reach you and how they access the um, uh, audit and all the things. Of course. So I love to talk with people on Instagram. My handle is tortoise and the bear. And then the free customer journey audit for podcast listeners is tortoise and the bear.com forward slash podcast. All right. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right. I've got just a couple (laughs) takeaways from my conversation with Hunter. First of all, I have to tell you that this is a topic that has been on my mind recently. As I mentioned in this episode, I've had not one, but three of my coaches, Eileen Hahn, Jessica Harling, and Amber De La Garza, all push me to bring on somebody as a COO integrator. Right. And I might have been able to ignore it if just one of them thought it was a brilliant idea. But with all three of them, you know, that's when you have to look around at your inner circle people and who are the ones that you trust. And, you know, the ones that have your back and are making suggestions based on their professional experience and their knowledge of you. And um, 
they're doing that for me. But there are also barriers in my mind to bringing like someone that someone that does this on. And it's so funny because we talk about the show like I don't have mindset problems about charging my worth and all those things. But I've said to you before, I I'm not ex- I'm not exempt from mindset problems. They're just different ones, right? We all have our things that kind of sh- handle us, to strap us together, right, and tie us up, right? So here's the thing. I'm in my own head about it. And I'm sure, you know, that you get it, right? We're driven people. It's why we became entrepreneurs. And we learn to rely on ourselves so much that sometimes it's hard to understand that not only can we not do it all, that we should not do it all. It's this, um, you know, I have this hamster wheel of thinking of myself as a self-reliant person. Okay. So, and I have this other hamster wheel thing that if I don't get something done, I say to myself, did you slack off? Like I just slacked off on that. I, I have to do better next time. Okay. But I love that Hunter, in addition to Eileen and Jessica and Amber, have pointed out to me that that's not the case. And the track, if you're on it similarly like I am, it's not sustainable. And if we just keep pushing ourselves, we're going to end up in burnout mode. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to burn out. Right. And there was a nuance in there that she mentioned that I want to highlight. She said that one of the red flags to look at at wondering if you are if you need to bring somebody on is when you are doing more tasks that you hate doing, let's just say dislike doing, in your business than you love. Because now you might be in danger of falling out of love with your business. So I'm just going to say I'm not in that danger yet. I might be doing things that I don't think I should do or I shouldn't be doing for sure, but I'm not out of love with this yet. So, um, all right, but I don't ever want to be in that situation, right? There are ebbs and flows, ups and downs and window works and Luann Igarra Inc. and exciting windows, but I've never felt like I don't love what I do and I don't want to feel that way and I don't want you to feel that way either. Because I know that you came to interior design because of a passion. I have yet to meet an interior designer that just ended up being a designer. Legit. Like, I don't know that I've ever met a single designer that just ended up, oh, well, I just fell into it. A, number one, it's entirely too hard to just do it for kicks and giggles, right? But B, you really all do come to it with this beautiful passion for it. And I don't want you to lose that because you're not picking your head up and honoring yourself as the CEO. All right. So I want you to think about if, you know, we're ringing the bell for you and that if you are in risk of falling out of love with your business, don't wait. Why can't we be proactive, right? Why can't we? (laughs) Why do we have to wait till there's a five alarm fire? I'm working on it. I am right? I know there have been many times in my business when I've waited until everything was on fire before I hired someone to help me out. I have been there, all right? And each time once that person came on, I've said, uh, hello, why did you wait? Okay. So whether you want to reach out to Hunter or go ahead and start that customer journey audit, right? Or you know it's time to bring someone into your team internally to carry out that role. I hope that your biggest takeaway today is not to wait for the fire, right? And maybe you're listening and the fire is happening now. Don't be ashamed of it. We've all been there, I promise you, right? Just take comfort in the fact that it's never too late. You always can change course. You're in charge. That's the cool thing about being your own boss, right? You can go and find your unicorn that's going to bring in the strengths that you don't have that will become your strategic partner and free you up to do the things in your business that you enjoy doing. All right. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Hunter, so much. Love it. Learn so much. And I appreciate that you offer this service to business owners like ourselves. And we will put the links in the show notes on how you can contact her. All right. Um, Okay. So, Luann University is opening up pretty soon. April 1st, registration is opening. Um, May 1st, um, the classes are going to start. And you can go check it out now, luannuniversity.com. All right, we have a full roster of five-week courses, and we also have our brand-new three-hour intensives. All right? So thank you tons for showing up. I appreciate you. Decide to be excellent.
Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day. Thank you.